We're going to go over a brief history of microbiology, and this will be part one. So the scientists that we're going to be talking about, you only need to know the ones that have their names in red. And if their names are not in red, you don't need to know them. You also do not need to memorize any of the dates. So just know the scientists whose names are in red and also know what they did. So our first scientist we're going to talk about is Robert Hooke. He was an English scientist working in the 1600s. And what he did was he saw the very first cells. Unfortunately, they were dead cells. So this is the microscope you can see that he used. Um, it was pretty primitive, as you can see, but he drew a picture of what he saw. He was looking at a piece of cork, which is dead wood, and he drew the dead plant cells that he saw. And so he could just see the cell walls, and that's what he drew. And he actually came up with the term cell because he thought that they looked like the bedrooms that the monks stayed in in the monasteries, which they called cells. And so that's where the word cell came from. And this eventually led to the cell theory, which some German scientists came up with in the 1830s. And the cell theory just states that all organisms are made of cells. And the second part of the cell theory says that all cells come from pre-existing cells. Okay, so I would definitely know the two parts to the cell theory. That would be a good test question. So I definitely would know that. Our next scientist is Anton van Leeuwenhoek. He was a Dutch scientist working in the 1600s as well. His main job, though, was selling fabric to make men's clothing. And on the side, he really liked to make little microscopes. He was very good at making the glass lenses. And these were the microscopes that he made. The way they worked is they had a little fine tip where you would put the specimen. And then he would hold that up to the light and look through that. And the lens would magnify whatever was on the tip there. And then he would draw what he would see. And this is a drawing from some of the plaque from his teeth. And so he actually observed the bacteria living in his mouth. And you could see that he could actually see the bacteria moving around. And so his claim to fame is he was the first person to see microorganisms. And so he's the, known as the father of microbiology because he was the first person to see microorganisms. Next, we have this idea of spontaneous generation. This is a really old idea that's been around since the time of Aristotle. Spontaneous generation is totally wrong but it states that living organisms arise from non-living matter. So you can see why they used to think this, because they didn't have microscopes back then and they wouldn't be able to see you know, cells dividing or egg and sperm or things like that. So they just thought, oh, you know, flies just 
generate from dead meat and you know that's where they're coming from so so that's spontaneous generation so our next scientist that you should know is Francesco Redeye he was an Italian scientist also working in the 1600s and he discredited the idea of spontaneous generation for larger organisms so this was his experiment that he did to disprove spontaneous generation for these larger organisms. So what he did was he took some dead meat, so non-living matter, and he put the meat into these jars. One of the jars he just left open so the flies could come in, lay their eggs on the meat, and then after a couple days the maggots would appear. The other jar that he put the meat in, he covered it with a lid. So the flies couldn't get in and lay their eggs and no maggots would appear. So he said, well, spontaneous generation is not true because the meat did not produce any maggots. Well, the critics said, well, for spontaneous generation to occur, air has to be able to get in and out because air is required for spontaneous generation to occur. So Red is like, okay, well, I'll fix that problem. So he went back and redid his experiment, and on his jar with the meat, he put a piece of cheesecloth on top. So the cheesecloth had little holes in it that air could get in and out, but the flies could not get in to get to the meat. So again, no maggots appeared because the flies could not get in and lay their eggs. And so that disproves spontaneous generation for larger organisms. So people were like, okay, fine. Spontaneous generation is not true for these larger organisms. You know, the flies are the source of the maggots. It's not coming, you know, the maggots are not appearing from the dead meat. But they didn't want to quite give up on this idea of spontaneous generation because it had been around for so long and they just couldn't quite give up that idea. So they're like, well, spontaneous generation must still be true for microorganisms. So they still hung on to that idea. Okay, so I definitely would know Francesco Redeye and also be able to tell me about what he did in his experiment on the test. In the 1700s, some scientists started doing some experiments to see if spontaneous generation was true for microorganisms or not. The first experiment was done by John Needham, which you don't need to know him. He was an English scientist, and with his experiment, what he did was he took some meat broth, which is dead, uh, non-living material, and put it in a flask. He boiled it which would kill off any microorganisms. And then he sealed the flask, came back in a couple of days, and the meat broth was cloudy and there were lots of microorganisms growing in it. And then 20 years later, another scientist, Lazaro Spallanzani, a time scientist, saw Needham's experiment and said, well, you did that wrong. And so what he did with his experiment was he took the meat broth, put it in the flask, so this non-living matter, he sealed it first, and then he boiled it to kill the microorganisms, let it sit for a few days, came back and checked it, and there was no growth of the microorganisms. So why did we have a difference between these two experiments? So why did we get growth in Needham's flask, but not in the second experiment? So what happened was in Needham's experiment, with his flask, he had allowed the flask, after he boiled it, they were open to the air. So the microorganisms that were in the air, they dropped in and contaminated that freshly boiled meat broth. 
And then after it had cooled, then he finally sealed it, but the microorganisms were already in it. Whereas with Spallanzani, he had sealed the flask before he boiled it. And so the microorganisms in the air could not get in and contaminate the broth, and so it stayed sterile, and so nothing grew. And that was the difference. And then a French scientist, Louis Pasteur, came along in 1861, and he decided that he was going to settle this question of spontaneous generation once and for all, because he was like, this is just not true. I know that there are microorganisms in the air. That's where they're coming from. They're not spontaneously generating from non-living matter. So let's just prove this once and for all and get rid of the spontaneous generation idea. So let's take a look at what he did. So this was Pasteur's experiment. It was pretty ingenious. And what he did was he used these special flasks. So he had made these swan-necked flasks with these really long curved necks. He had put the meat broth in first before he, he had pulled out these long necks. And these necks were open to the air. But once he boiled the meat broth that was in here, if he left the neck intact, the air could get in and out, but the microorganisms that were in the air, they could not get all the way in and get into the meat broth. So when he came back a couple days later to check the meat broth, it was still sterile and nothing was growing in it. But with his other set of experiments, the other set of flasks, he broke the neck off. And if he broke the neck off, the microorganisms in the air could get into the flask. And after a couple days, there were lots of microorganisms growing in there. So he proved that spontaneous generation was not true. The microorganisms were out in the air, and that's where they were coming from. They were not spontaneously generating from the dead meat broth. So they finally gave up on this idea of spontaneous generation, and they finally said, all right, fine. The microorganisms are not spontaneously generating. So we finally got rid of that idea. Okay, and then just to mention, um, this is just kind of interesting. You can look at it. You don't need to memorize any of this. There's uh, a golden age of microbiology where a lot of discoveries were made from the 1850s to early 1900s. And you can just kind of look through this. Um, just interesting to see what kind of things were discovered. You don't need to memorize any of that. Another big development in microbiology was the discovery that microorganisms caused infectious diseases. So before this was discovered, they used to think that infectious diseases were caused by things like supernatural forces. So like God was mad at you, that's why you got the flu. Or maybe it was a miasma that was making you sick. Miasma just means bad air. So back then, um, things were pretty smelly. So they didn't have garbage pickup or sewer systems. You know, people just threw their sewage out in the gutters. So things really stunk because there was a lot of decaying stuff around. And so they thought that bad smelly air was what was making you sick. Um, or maybe your humors were imbalanced. Um, humors is a really old term for your body fluids. Um, your humors, there were four humors um, that they talked about. Your humors were your blood, um, they had black bile, yellow bile, and then phlegm, so stuff you would cough up. And so they would try to balance your humors. So they would do things like bloodletting or giving you enemas. Um, and that obviously usually would not help you in probably would make you more sick or maybe even kill you. <laughs> so not a good way to treat somebody. Um, so this eventually was replaced with this idea of the germ theory of disease. 
And what this says is that microorganisms cause infectious diseases. How the germ theory of disease came about is that some scientists were starting to make some observations that microorganisms were causing infectious diseases. So you don't need to know any of these scientists at all. But one scientist showed that a disease in silkworms was caused by a fungus. And then another scientist showed that a water mold, which is related to algae, cause the great potato blight of Ireland. Louis Pasteur is back. He discovered more evidence for the germ theory of disease. He was interested in fermentation and discovered that the microorganisms yeast were the ones that carried out fermentation and were converting the sugars in grape juice into alcohol, which made the wine. He was also called upon by the wine industry to help them solve a problem with their wine, which was spoiling. He discovered that the bacteria that had contaminated the wine were converting the alcohol in the wine into acetic acid, which is vinegar, which would make the wine taste really sour and disgusting, and then they wouldn't be able to sell their wine. So he came up with a process of pasteurization where he would briefly heat up the wine to kill off the bacteria without destroying the flavor of the wine. So that's where pasteurization came from. So around this time in the 1860s, a British surgeon, Joseph Lister, was reading the papers that Louis Pasteur had published on his ideas on fermentation and his thoughts on how microorganisms could cause things to decompose and change. And Pasteur was thinking that, well, not only could these microorganisms cause things like wine to decompose and spoil, but maybe they could also be causing diseases. So Joseph Lister saw that and he's like, well, this is probably what's going on in my surgery patients because at the time they had no aseptic technique at all. Um, this was when surgery was very dirty. The dirtier the surgeon was, that was seen as a sign of respect that you were a better surgeon. So they would not wash their hands. Instruments were not cleaned. Um, their clothes were just all bloody and gross. And that was seen as a sign of a really good surgeon, which was pretty horrific when we think about it today. So obviously you can imagine their rates of surgical infection were really high. And Lister was really tired of losing a lot of his patients to post-surgical infections. So in reading Pasteur's papers, he decided, well, I'm going to try some of Pasteur's idea, because Pasteur had mentioned, well, we can kill these microorganisms by filtering them out, heating things up, or using chemicals to kill them. So Lister's like, well, I can't use filters or heat on the patient's wounds. So let's apply chemicals. So he decided to use a chemical that was being used to clean sewers at the time. It's called carbolic acid, which we'll uh, talk about later. So he started putting that on his surgeons, on his um, patient's wounds, and also started having um, his other students in the hospital he worked at and also himself and uh, washing their hands in this carbolic acid, washing the instruments in it. They even were spraying the um, air around the surgery room with the carbolic acid because they knew that the microorganisms were in the, in the air from Pasteur's experiments 
And unfortunately, the carbolic acid was uh, pretty irritating to breathe in and also irritating to the tissue. But the carbolic acid did work in killing off the microorganisms and preventing infections after surgery. So his patients survived and um, he developed aseptic technique for surgery. So we can thank him for that. So a lot of things are named after Lister, a lot of instruments and even Listerine is named after Joseph Lister.